Good evening, good evening. How are we doing this evening? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, friends. I'm happy to be here. How about you? Oh, amen. Praise the Lord, friends. Today is day three of our Gospel Medical Evangelism Summer Convocation. I'm happy to be here. Um, we have a, I believe there's much blessings in store for us today, as there was on day one and day two. And God is, again, going to pour out some blessings for us today, friends. So before we begin, let us open up with a word of prayer at this time. Those joining us here locally, as well as those joining us online. Most kind and gracious Father, we thank you so much for your blessings toward us. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity wherein we can come before your presence and to be taught of the master teacher, master physician himself, Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh Father, that you may be with us throughout these segments, throughout these presentations. I pray that we may have eyes to see, ears to hear what the Spirit of God desires to teach us. I pray, O oh Father, that you may move in a mighty way through this crowd, through uh, this place, O oh Father, and help us, O oh God, to receive the blessings that you desire to pour out. Be with each presenter, be with the musicians, the singers, Lord, be uh, please, even in our hearts today, that we may receive a blessing. We thank you for hearing and for answering. In Jesus' precious name we do pray, amen. Amen. It is my honor again to welcome you all, those here locally, as well as those joining us online via YouTube, as well as Facebook. Um, again, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for this evening. Of course, we're going to have um, Barbara O'Neill, Dr. Barbara O'Neill, present another powerful practical um, presentation for us. She's going to be talking on the subject of diabetes. Diabetes is a very interesting subject, so you don't want to uh, miss that. Take your notes, your pencils, your pens, writing utensils to be making notes this evening. And our keynote speaker that will be sharing the word with us this evening is Evangelist Elder Jose Sanchez. He will be breaking bread with us. So I pray that we will all have attentive ears, amen, for what God is going to share with us this evening. And so without further ado, I'm going to invite singing evangelist, Brother Paul, to bless us with a musical selection, and after that, the next voice you will hear is that of Barbara O'Neill. God bless. Greetings, everyone. a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a wonderful, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Troubles dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all my darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross my Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, 
Whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'm going to be talking on diabetes. In Australia, I'm not sure of the US figures, in Australia, there's 500 new diabetics diagnosed every day in Australia. And we also have looked at Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there's an equal and an opposite reaction. Actually, it's not Newton's third law of motion. It's God's law, isn't it? And we see it in Galatians 6 verse 7 where the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. But there's a great deceiver out there that has deceived people to the point where they don't realise that what they are eating, what they are doing is actually contributing to their diabetes. If it's a straight out lie, you see it straight away, but with deception. With deception, it is not as it seems. So that's what I'd like to do this evening. I'd like to, to sweep the curtain aside and show you why there is such a... In fact, if you want to talk about pandemics, I think you'd have to say diabetes is, yes? It's worldwide. It certainly is. And there is a reason, because Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. And in Job 29 verse 16, the Bible says, The cause I knew not, I searched out. I was uh, consulting with a man about 10 years ago now in Melbourne, down, right down the bottom of Australia. I said to him, what do you do for work? He said, I'm a private investigator. I said, so am I. We should all be private investigators, investigating why these things are so. And we should all be our own doctor. Because only you know how you feel, only you know what you've been through, and only you know how your body responds or reacts. And a very important part of being your own doctor is listening. Have you ever been to a doctor that won't listen? It's very frustrating. Don't be that doctor. You must listen. Listen because the body will speak to you. And if you don't listen to the first whisper, the body will start screaming. And when it starts screaming, it's doing damage. So listen and respond. So whenever there's an illness, the three things you look at, history, because history indicates why these things are so. Symptoms. Medically, 
symptoms are treated. But when symptoms are treated with a drug, it just takes away the voice. Now, in the 1970s, I had a little car which was a Fiat, and whenever the oil would get low, this blue light would start flashing. It was very annoying. So what if I get a hammer and smash that blue light, then that annoying light is not there anymore. How, I'm not a mechanic. How, how long will I be driving for before the engine seizes up? You've got to listen. You've got to res respond to the symptoms. So even though most drugs just silence the symptoms, when you're treating someone naturally, you're working with the healing powers that God put into that body, you do treat symptoms because symptoms are the body's voice. It's saying, excuse me, I need a little bit of help over here. And then as you apply simple natural remedies, adjusting, implementing the true remedies, the sustain me principles, then you watch for this the body's response. And the body will go, no, that's not doing much, or the body will say, I like that. And if the body says, I like that, that's where you go. That's, that's your guideline. And remember, I'm going to give you four words here. The first word is I. I am the master of my destiny. I'm the one that chooses what I do or what I don't do with my body. The human body will heal itself. Here's the two-letter word. If you give it the right conditions, and we've seen many people totally conquer from diabetes, type 1 and type 2. And then the three-letter word, why? If the body's not responding, then we ask why. And it could possibly be the four-letter word, time. The Bible says in Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Most people don't get sick overnight and they don't get better overnight, have you noticed? <laughs> Sometimes it's 20, 30 years in the making. The good news is it's not 20, 30 years to heal, but it might take a year or two. You've got to give it a little bit of time. And the other verse that you can give to encourage people with the time factor is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. It says, Cast not away, therefore, thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence in God. Don't cast away your confidence in this amazing body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. Cast not away, therefore, thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. Did you hear that? <laughs> For ye have need of patience in that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. And if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe in the saving of the soul. I'd like to add another one there. But of them that believing in the healing of the body. Yep. And Jesus come to save not just the soul, but the emotions, the mental, the physical. He treats us as a whole. And we're all connected. So let us now go deep. Let us go deep into the human body to the inside workings of the cell. Proverbs 14 verse 6 states that, that uh, knowledge is easy to him that understands. I want to take you inside the CBD, the central business district of the human body, the inside workings of the cell. I want to take you inside because when you understand how this process works, you begin to have the knowledge on what the body needs to prevent diabetes and also to heal from diabetes. So I'm going to begin by showing you common foods that people eat today and what happens inside the cell. And we've come to a 
time on planet Earth where human beings are eating a huge amounts of carbohydrates. Let's have a look. Bread. Bread shops abound. You go into a supermarket. There's a whole aisle devoted to bread. And obviously, it's a popular food. Cereal, there's a whole aisle devoted to cereal. And Dr. Kellogg would have a pink fit if he could see what Dr. Kellogg's cornflakes are made out of today. Mm -hmm. Now, the third one, I'm going to say one word, but I actually could add 20 words and that would fill the whole board. We're going to say cakes, etc. So this takes into consideration cookies, uh, croissants, muffins, biscuits. Well, do you know we call cookies biscuits? You call them cookies. So when Australians come to America and see a sign that says biscuits and gravy, we just think, whoa, <laughs> what, what do these people eat? <laughs> So did we think like your cookies with gravy on top, but I think a biscuit is a scone yeah. or a roll. Yeah. yeah. So in there we've we've also got uh, pretzels, donuts. So you can see what I mean. Pasties, pies, all the the pastries. So we just say cakes, etc. Also pizza. As a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent, a child of the 60s, I didn't even know what pizza was. I didn't know what pasta was. What did we eat? We had sausages or chops, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans every single night of the week, except for Sunday when mum did a roast lamb. Rice, we never had rice either. I don't think I had rice until I was about 18. Potatoes, yes, we did have potatoes every single day. And I still make potatoes every single day because my husband is an Irishman and potatoes are important. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallised acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. Would you agree with me? Yeah. That people have become high carbohydrate consumers and I don't think anyone chose to eat this way. I think it's just convenience. I have ladies say to me, Barbara, you don't understand. I don't have time to cook. I don't cook. I'm just too busy. And so when people are hungry, what do they grab? But you know what's interesting? I lived in a rainforest for 12 years, raised my children up in the rainforest, and everything we ate, I made. I made everything. <laughs> And so this was not fast food when you're making it yourself, is it? Down on the farm, that's your slow food. What's your fast food? Fruits and vegetables. It's just, ah, apple, eat apple. And because people are so busy today and they reach for the convenience, they reach for the heart fast, we've actually lost conception, really, of the way that we should be eating. All of these foods break down in the gastrointestinal tract to a singular structure called glucose. Glucose now is in the blood. Did you know your gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube and anything that goes into the hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to glucose, then it goes absorbed into the blood. And the Bible says in Leviticus 17:11 uh, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. <laughs> and something that makes it Life is the nutrients from the food that we eat. So it's broken down in the gastrointestinal tract to glucose. It gets absorbed into the blood. Now it goes on the M1 main highway, portal vein, straight to liver. And then the liver determines where it goes. And the first place that it will send the glucose is to the cell. So the glucose goes into the cell under the action of insulin. Insulin's the hormone that unlocks the door to allow the glucose into the cell. So let's draw our pancreas and have a look at what it's doing. The pancreas lives under your left rib, your liver lives under your right rib, and your pancreas releases two hormones into the blood. One is insulin, and insulin's role is to get the blood sugar level in the blood down by taking the glucose into the cell. 
it releases another hormone, and that's glucagon. And glucagon is the hormone that's released if blood sugar levels go too low, it's released to get the blood sugar level up again. So can you see that God, in his wisdom and his mercy, when he created the pancreas, it's the organ that balances our blood sugar levels. And when everything's working well in the body, these two hormones work very nicely together. But something happens that is causing a disruption, and that's what we're going to look at. And so the first place that the liver sends the glucose is into the cell. It goes into the cell and it goes through 20 little chemical reactions or 20-step pathway. It's called the glycolytic pathway. And it delivers to us 30, uh, two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse of the cell. It's the Krebs cycle inside of the mitochondria. Only an eight-step pathway, but this eight-step pathway delivers to us a very impressive 36 units of energy. Oxygen makes the difference. The 20-step pathway does not use oxygen. It produces energy by the process of fermentation. Whereas the eight-step pathway, because of the presence of oxygen, it gives us 36 units of energy. But there's still a lot of glucose left over. Only so much can be sent to the cell. So now the liver stores some. And this storage is called glycogen. And it's like a little bunch of grapes sitting inside the muscle cell. And these little, each grape, so to speak, is a molecule of, ox of, of glucose. It's an amazing process. So glycogen is a name given to quick-release glucose store, already sitting in your muscle cell. That's why you do not need to, ex you do not need to eat before you exercise. So this morning, I looked very hard, but I couldn't find a park. I followed some trees, <laughs> but there's no park near me. But I went round and round and round, and I had quite a good walk. And I did not need to eat before I walked, because I've got glycogen stores already sitting in my muscle cell. And when I started to move my body, especially when I found a hill, and I needed glucose, the body just plucks the glucose, feeds it down the pathways. Plucks, feeds it down the pathways. Plucks it, feeds it down the pathways. And because I'm moving the body, because I'm working faster and faster, my breathing is getting deeper and I'm getting more oxygen, so I'm getting more, uh, more energy. That's why it is true that you will receive more energy than you expend on your morning walk. I know one young man, he's a friend of mine, he, um, he just got some very bad news about his wife was having an affair. He said to me, I work all day, so I've got two little boys to care for. He said, I've made an appointment with a personal trainer <coughs> three nights a week. He said, I go to that personal trainer and it's the last thing I want to go to. I'm just done, but I've paid. <laughs> He said, but I come out physically exhausted and emotionally revived. Because as he works out and breathes deeper, he's getting more oxygen revived. When every single one of your 75 trillion cells has enough oxygen to get down to there, you're going to be jumping out of your skin. Sounds good. Let's move on with the journey of the glucose. On a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got glucose left over because only so much can be stored as glycogen. And so now the body stores it. In the most amazing fuel depot in the body, it's called fat cells. And on this high carbohydrate diet, what's happening to the average American? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Fat doesn't make you fat. So this is the third place that the liver specifically sends. 
the glucose, is to be stored as fat. As I go through my description of diabetes, what happens in the cell is of the utmost importance. So a few things that are contributing to diabetes today, and it's basically the breakfast of a nation, has the three main things that are causing diabetes. So what, what would that be? Let's say the average would be cereal, and most cereal is made out of wheat. Yeah? I know in Australia you might have heard of wheat bix and wheaties. There's lots of cereals made out of wheat. So what's the problem with wheat? Didn't God made wheat? He did. The problem is that in the 1950s, Dr. Norman Bullag and his team of researchers put wheat through intensive crossbreeding. <clears throat> See, they were, they were trying to create a plant with a high yield of grain. And they did it for a, um, apparently noble purpose to reduce, um, reduce poverty in especially countries like Africa, India, Mexico. And so after many years of intensive crossbreeding, the plant had a high yield of grain, but the stalk would break. Because when I was a little girl, wheat grew this high. Have you noticed how high it grows today? Only grows this high. So they had to go back to the drawing board and they came up with a plant that only grows about two foot. It has a thick stem so it can hold the heavy yield of grain. And some plants are producing six to eight times more grain than the original plant. Dr. Norman Boulin got a Nobel Prize for his hybridised wheat. But because they didn't think they have to put wheat through safety studies, there were no safety studies done. <clears throat> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? No safety studies done. And farmers loved it because they're getting 10 times sometimes 10, sometimes 8, sometimes 6, more grain per acre. 1976, uh, he got the Nobel Prize and then it, then it went worldwide. So by the 1990s, every bread, every cereal, every cake, every pizza, every pasta, and of course all the cake section, donuts, pretzels, etc., etc., they're all made out of the hybridised wheat. But it's only now it's starting to be revealed the danger of this hybridised wheat. <clears throat> you can't improve on God. The, God the, the wheat that God wa made was perfect for humanity. But this hybridised wheat, it's starting to be revealed the problems. A friend of mine, she's a physician, she finally retired at the age of 78. She said, I've been a physician for 40 years. She said, 40 years ago, you never heard of gluten intolerance. 20 years ago, it was just starting to murmur. <clears throat> if we want to talk about a pandemic, I think you'd say gluten intolerance, <laughs> gluten sensitivity. And a lot of people are intolerant and sensitive and don't even know it. The two most common symptoms of a gluten sensitivity or intolerance are brain fog and bloating. And as you'll see on Friday night and Saturday, the one part of the body that the great deceiver wants to take down is the brain. He wants to interfere with the part of our body where we communicate with God. It made a very, it or created a very complex protein structure. There's your gluten intolerance. But I want to look at something else that's dramatically affecting diabetes. The hybridization of the wheat changed the starch structure. So the starch structure that was created in the hybridization of the wheat is called amylopectin, amylopectin A. Let's have a look at <coughs> blood glucose levels. Say that's, that's normal. The amylopectin A will get the blood glucose levels up very high, very fast, and then there's always a corresponding drop. That's your amylopectin A. Let me give you something to compare it to. Amylopectin B is found in bananas, potatoes, and if you're familiar with the glycemic index of food, bananas and potatoes are quite high. 
So where do they sit? So bananas and potatoes get the blood sugar level up relatively high, relatively fast, and so you get a relatively low jump. So there's your B. Amylopectin C is found in all your beans. That's cabanzos, lentils, lima beans, cannelloni beans. That gives a lovely steady rise, maintenance and a nice steady drop. What does every single cell in our body want? God designed the body and the food that's supposed to go in the body to receive a consistent, steady delivery of fuel. But can you see that these amylopectins A's and B's are getting that quick rise and whenever you get a quick rise you've got a corresponding dump. I think everyone knows that refined sugar certainly gets the quick rise and the quick dump. But how many of these foods are the refined sugar and the wheat together? There's always sugar in bread. That's what yeast grows on. Cereal, I challenge you, find a cereal without any sugar in it. <laughs> Cakes, all of the donuts, etc., etc., etc. And the pizza, it does have sugar because the yeast needs the sugar to rise. Probably the pasta is the only one that doesn't have the refined sugar. So a lot of those foods are a combination of the refined sugar and wheat. A man wrote to me, he said, Barbara, you're wrong on the wheat. Jesus said that he was the bread of life. I said, he is the bread of life. But the bread he's referring to is not the bread we have today. <laughs> the bread we have today is a lot different to the bread that was made on... In fact, you can still get wheat that has not been hybridised. They call it ancient grains. So spelt, uh, kamut, enkenhorn, they're what's traditionally called the ancient grains. They're called ancient grains because they have not been hybridised. So let me show you where it sits on the glycemic index. So what's the glycemic index? The glycemic index of foods is how quickly the glucose in the food is released into the blood. And this can make a dramatic difference on a diabetic whose pancreas is compromised and not working well. Baseline is 55, so anything under 55 is considered low GI. Let me give you some illustrations. Cherries. Cherries sit at uh, 26. Grapefruit. It's not a surprise that grapefruit sits at 25. So they're, they're good, good fruits for the diabetics because they release glucose steadily, whereas banana, it releases quick, so that can get the blood sugar level up high. So a diabetic can actually control their blood sugar levels very well by just targeting low GI foods. It's not hard to Google uh, glycemic index chart and, and have a look at that. Potatoes, it sits very high, whereas sweet potato, it's probably about 45, it's a little bit low. So what's the difference? You look at the potato and the sweet potato, you cut them. What's the difference? Under a microscope, it's revealed that in the white potato, the fibre structure is loose, quickly releasing the glucose. But under a microscope, if you look at the sweet potato, the fibre structure is tight slowly releasing the glucose. That, that's really what makes the difference. Where does sugar sit on the glycemic index? Whether it's white or tan or brown, it sits at 59. That's not a surprise. Uh, white, white bread, so we'll just say all the white wheats, sits at 69. Hey. How so? It's because of the amylopectin A. That means a slice of white bread would get the blood sugar level up higher than even a candy. Eey. Whole meal or whole wheat, where does that sit? Whole wheat sits at 72. Now how could this be? Isn't the whole wheat better than the white? Absolutely, it's got more fibre, it's got more B vitamins. But regarding amylopectin A, 
because the whole wheat is not refined, it has more amylopectin A in it, so it can get the blood sugar level up quicker than the refined. My husband said to me, Barbara, what are you saying? I've just had a call where a lady says, Barbara says white bread's better than whole wheat bread. I said, ah, uh-huh. she, she's actually seen this. Obviously the whole wheat is much better, it's got fibre, but we got for the diabetic who's looking at their blood sugar levels until that pancreas becomes a happy pancreas, one needs to be cautious on the food that it's given. So this wheat, let's have a look at that. You're looking at 1970s, it started to go worldwide. 1990s, uh, it, it's established worldwide. Farmers love it. They're getting six to eight times more grain per acre. That's six to eight times more money per acre. They've got to pay their bills. <laughs> so very difficult, very challenging for a farmer to find out about the wheat and want to make the decision to go to ancient grains he's looking at a big monetary loss because he's not going to get as much grain per acre. You see that? I found it very difficult, um, very interesting looking at Ellen White's writings in the little book Temperance, Temperance chapter 2. I think on the second page she looks at the devil and his angels trying to make something that's going to really bring... Uh, be a curse to humanity. And Satan came up with a plan. He would change the fruit of the vine, comma, and the wheat. That's the only food that is quoted in that section, the wheat. The wheat, and that's exactly what happened. Maybe 50 years after that was written, Dr. Norman Bullag and his team, with an apparently noble purpose for the starvation crisis, change the wheat in a, in a name to get more grain per acre, but in the process it created something that's proving to be very harmful to human beings. Do I eat wheat? I do, but not much. But if I had diabetes, I wouldn't touch it. And if I have a choice, I eat other grains. But I'm travelling, so there's not always a choice. And I think if I had cereal and toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, pasta for tea, overloaded the wheat and how many do? I think then I'd start to see some problems. You see, in Genesis 1.29, when God's telling Adam and Eve what to eat, he's, he said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed. That's many. There's so many different grains. He didn't say, behold, I've given you wheat. And yet how many people, that's their predominant grain. It's time to explore the other grains. It's time to go to the ancient grains. It's, it's time to have a look at the huge variety of grains that we have. So we're looking at some of the causes of diabetes and number one has to be wheat. Number two, sugar. There was no diabetes on the planet till sugar was established. In his fascinating account of the history of sugar, um, William Dufty, the book's called Sugar Blues, because what does sugar cause? The blues. It gets a blood sugar level, level rise incredibly fast and very quickly the brain says to the pancreas, quick, overload of glucose, send a corresponding amount of insulin and so the insulin comes and it does a good job and it gets it down, down, down. Yeah. And now the brain says, oh no, we're too low. Stop the insulin, release the glucagon. Glucagon's the one that gets it up again. But what does the person usually do down there? Have a sweet, yeah, to get it up again. Does that get it up? Oh yes. Now it's too high. Oh no, now we're too high. Stop the glucagon. <sighs> And that poor old pancreas, what's happening? Gets to the point where it says, oh, I'm sick of this. I'm not going to go to work anymore. But something happens before that. And that is with this high glucose, high insulin, 
trying to get into the cell, the cell ends up going, I'm sick of the sight of you, we've already got too much. It's called insulin resistance. Mm. And so what happens is, the brain thinks there's still too much glucose, more insulin, more insulin, more insulin, but it's actually not getting into the cell because there's insulin resistance. So the glucose has to spill out somewhere into the urine. Diabetes mellitus means sweet urine. The overflow is being urinated out. And we've got a very unhappy pancreas that says, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm against child abuse, I'm against animal abuse, and I'm against pancreatic abuse. <laughs> but what a huge deception when the people don't realise that they are. Isn't that the worst deception? That's like kicking and kicking a dog and not realising it's hurting the dog. It's, it's, it's crazy. And isn't that what deception is? And in Revelation chapter 12, verse, verse 9, the Bible says that great deceiver was cast out, um, that great dragon was cast out, the old deceiver called the devil and Satan, which has deceived the whole world, even in the food. <laughs> That's what he's best at, deception. The third, and as a child, this is what we had for breakfast every day, the milk. <laughs> Isn't that right? The milk on the cereal with the sugar on top. Mm -hmm. So we've looked at how the first two are big contributing factors to diabetes. What about the milk? In his book, Dr. Colin Candle states, in his book, The China Study, he shows, in fact, he's got 70 years of research up his sleeve. He hasn't been researching for 70 years, but he quotes a lot of other research. That when we don't have the enzymes in our gut to break down milk, and do you know we don't really have them past babyhood? There are some tribes, like the Maasai, who do still have that enzyme in their gut because for centuries they live on blood, milk and meat. Now, it's not a balanced diet <laughs> and I think they live and are as healthy as they are because they're so active. But it certainly isn't an ideal diet, but they do have the enzymes in the gut that break down the cow's milk. So my girlfriend, she has a... She have a, has an orphanage in Nakuru, Kenya, and they never used to take babies, but last 10 years they've started to take baby orphans. And they had some Maasai babies, and the Maasai babies do not do well on the soy milk. She said all the babies, they give soy milk because they're vegetarians themselves, and the husband was watching these babies getting thinner and sicker, so he went and bought a cow, <laughs> milked the cow. <laughs> gave the cow's milk to the Maasai babies and the Maasai babies thrive because they have their enzymes. So we also need to look at genetics. I'm a fifth generation um, Australian Scottish descent. Oh, I have never been able to handle milk. <laughs> when I was a little girl, we used to have to drink a bottle of milk. Remember that in my, those from my era in school every day? I just felt ill after this milk. It's obviously not in my genes. I don't think there are any dairy farmers back there. <laughs> but when there's dairy farming in the family, you know, they are more likely to have the enzymes that can break down those big uh, molecules from the cow's milk. But most people don't. The current uh, research in Australia showed that 60% of Australians can't handle the cow's milk. See, cow's milk's very good milk for baby calves. And people say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned, I eat food. <laughs> Milk's for babies. I breastfed all my babies for two, three years, last one, three years. And I'd, by the time they'd weaned, they had a full set of teeth and they were eating food. No, no need for any other milk. So what happens in the gut when the milk is not broken down properly and it gets into the blood antibodies are made to wipe out those partially digested um, protein and sugar, uh, 
dairy molecules. But the shape of them is very similar to the beta cells in the pancreas that make insulin. And so what these antibodies do is they come along and they start wiping out the beta cells because they're very similar in structure to those molecules from the milk. So these, these three foods <laughs> that so predominantly have been eating for breakfast are big contributing factors to diabetes. And a bleach that bleaches white flour, well, refined flour white, because refined flour, when the germ and the bran are taken out, it's probably the colour of the inside of my skin. But they want it white, so they bleach it. And the bleach is a lantern. That's the name of the bleach that they bleach flour to make it white. And they have shown that a lantern kills the beta cells in the pancreas. Oof. <laughs> no wonder we have 500 new diabetics being diagnosed every day in Australia. So how can we turn this around? You're probably not surprised to see me put the word sustained me up. Because these are the basic laws of health that God declared are the true remedies, no matter what the problem. So sunshine, our pancreas needs vitamin D to function properly. Did you get some sunshine today? You don't need much, but you need some. Use of water. The glucagon and the insulin need water to be made. So if a person's dehydrated, their pancreas is not going to be able to make their hormones effectively that are designed to balance the blood sugar levels. Sleep. It is while we sleep. Tomorrow night, we're going to go inside the brain and we're going to have a look at what happens when you sleep. And when we sleep, our body is revived and recharged. So to be able to recharge and revive that pancreas, it needs us to sleep. And it needs us to sleep every night. And just as we need eight glasses of water at least a day, there's another eight, and that is eight hours of sleep every night. Shocking news. Not many people are getting the eight hours. And after you hear what happens when we sleep, you're going to want to start aiming for that. Trust it, trust in God. Stress complicates every disease, no matter what it is. But trusting in God and thanking him. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. If you have diabetes, God wants you to say, thank you, Father. Thank you. Because when we thank God for what's happening in our lives, we untie his hands and we allow him to work in our lives. So when I broke my little toe four and a half weeks ago, this is actually the first time I've worn proper shoes. <laughs> I'm pretty excited I've got shoes on. And it's not too upset. When I broke my little toe, what did God want me to do? Thank you, Father. Thank you. I don't like it, I'm not happy about it, but when I say thank you, Father, I'm trusting him. Amen. Do you remember the verse I gave you in the beginning? It was found in Hebrews chapter 10. The just shall live by faith. Faith at every single step. And you know what faith is? It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You cannot... If you, you cannot see it, that's faith. I believe that my pancreas will heal. That's faith. And trusting in God means faith in God, absolute faith that God is able. Amen. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And what is that power? That's the power that he's promised to each one of us, which is the Holy Spirit. He said to his disciples, and you'll see this in John chapter 14, starting at verse 
16, he says, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be with you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. That's the power that worketh in us when God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, even to heal our pancreas. Here's a great verse to quote. It's found in Ezekiel 36, 36, easy to remember. That the heathen that are left round about might know that I, the Lord God, build the ruined places. Do you have ruined beta cells? <laughs> God says, I, the Lord God, will build the ruined places and plant again that which was desolate. For I, the Lord God, have spoken it and I will do it. He stands behind every single promise. You can trust him. But it's important to stop. There are some things that must stop if you want to conquer diabetes. Let's just define the stops. That's why that's an important part of the laws of health. <laughs> some things must stop. I love the story of Daniel in chapter, chapter 1. He says that he purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the king's food and wine and other. And that ties in with 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know you not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Well, that takes it to another level. But the great deceiver has deceived, remember, the whole world, not realising that some of the things they're taking into their body is defiling it. I am the master of my destiny. I am the one that chooses what goes in and what doesn't. So I need to investigate and find out what's in this. I was in the supermarket one day and I saw a lady. And she had a big wire around her neck and the biggest magnifying glass I've ever seen she's looking. What's she looking at? You know, it's the fine print. You know, when you see that print so fine, you get the message, they don't want me to know, they don't want me to know that bit. You have to do that every time you shop, only the first time. Then you know exactly where to go. Stop the wheat. Stop the sugar. Stop the caffeine. You see, caffeine causes a crisis response and whenever there's a crisis response in the body, there are, there's a release of insulin to get more glucose into the cell so that you've got the power to do the run or the climb or the fight of your life. Most people don't realise that, that caffeine causes an insulin response. And we're looking at a, pa a pancreas who's already been overstimulated in the release of insulin with the high carbohydrate diet. Alcohol, I think it's fairly obvious what that does to the pancreas, it's high sugar. Tobacco, tobacco robs every single cell in the body of oxygen and the pancreas is made up of cells that run like this. So there are some things that must stop. Meat, dairy, and I just showed you how that milk is contributing to diabetes. We need to go back to the Garden of Eden diet. And in the Garden of Eden diet, there was none of that. Well, there was sugar cane and there was wheat that wasn't hybridised. <laughs> inhale. When we inhale through our noses, have you been practising? Yeah. Not easy, is it? <laughs> when we inhale through our nose, Using God's LSD, long, slow, deep. Did you try it going to sleep last night? Ten times. 5.5 seconds in. Hold it for three. 5.5 seconds out. Ten times. Not many people are still awake after the tenth time. If you are, do it another ten times. <laughs> LSD, long, slow, deep. 
Nutrition. What is the best nutrition for someone wanting to conquer diabetes? The best nutrition for someone wanting to conquer diabetes is, and these are the three essential food groups, high fibre. All plant foods have fibre and what fibre does is slowly releases the glucose. That's what the diabetic wants. But particularly the proteins are very important. And the plant protein is the best protein. There's your beans, or sometimes called legumes, nuts, and they're not, they're not hard to eat, are they? Delicious. Seeds. I, I aim for about eight to ten nuts every meal. They're my two main meals. Most people don't eat nuts for a four, for You don't know fortnight, do you? Two weeks? They don't eat nuts for two weeks, buy a bag of cashews, eat the whole lot in the afternoon, is that right? So just take, take eight to ten every meal. It's a lovely dessert, is a handful of nuts. Fats. And your best fats come from your nuts, come from your seeds, come from your olive and coconut oils. There is a fat, and I should have put this on the stop list, but if you've written a stop list, you can add it, and that is your altered oils. We talked about them a bit last night and how they're contributing to the damage of the arterial walls, contributing to high blood pressure and heart disease and strokes. Those damaged oils are also very damaging for the pancreas, so they must stop. So there's your best nutrition. And low, keep the carbohydrates low. And if you are having a high fibre, beans every day, nuts and seeds every meal, good fats, that automatically will be a low carbohydrate diet. Instead of having two cups of rice and one cup of lentils, have half a cup of rice, two cups of lentils and a big salad. So you just change the ratios. Moderation. Moderation in all the good things. Exercise. Exercise and the change in diet can quickly turn around insulin resistance. And I want to show you why. So how do we quickly turn around insulin resistance? I touched on it last night. On, last night I touched on a form of exercise that is a high intensity interval training. And we looked at that in reference to heart. But I want to show you how it directly affects the inside workings of the cell having a dramatic effect on blood glucose levels. So as the name implies, these are intervals of high intensity, intervals of recovery, and usually done for a cycle. 30 seconds is usually the rule of thumb. If you think 30 seconds isn't very long, try doing it when you're doing high intensity. 30 push-ups. We should all do push-ups every single day. Have you done your push-ups today? We need to be strengthening upper body. When you've done 30 push-ups, you're doing high intensity. Remember, always through the nose, always through the nose. Yes, I did my 30 push-ups this morning. And by the end of your 30 push-ups, You've got your high intensity. High intensity might be running up hills. High intensity might be exercise bike. If you've got a rebounder, you can do high intensity on the rebounder by jogging on the rebounder. My son Peter was doing that. We've got a little dent in our wooden floor now where Peter was doing his high intensity on the rebounder. I said, we'll never forget you and the rebounder, Pete. We've got a dent <laughs> in the floor. He's a little bit heavier than I am. Recovery time is usually 90 seconds. 
If you find that your recovery time takes longer, that's perfectly fine. Rome wasn't built in a day. If you can only do one or two sets of high intensity, so be it. Because as you implement this and reach up to the cycle of six, you'll find that your recovery time will get less and less. And if you can stick to those times, that's only 15 minutes in a day. That's not long at all. This is the best insurance policy you can make. This is one of the best ways you can, along with everything else we've looked at, is preventing diabetes, but also recovering from diabetes. And I want to take you inside the cell and show you what's happening inside the cell with the high intensity interval training. So to explain this, the 20-step pathway, and we looked at this when we looked at cancer. Remember, it's a very fast pathway. It's consuming sometimes 15 times the glucose compared to the 8-step pathway, which is a slow pathway. But there's a rate-setting enzyme in there that will always keep this one faster and this one slower. So when you're to your end of your first set of high intensity, the 20-step pathway speeds up, the 8-step pathway speeds up, and that's not a surprise. But because they're both sped up and the revs are higher up here, more pyruvate is being made than can be fed into the slower pathway. And so the body stores that excess pyruvate as lactic acid. We've heard of lactic acid. In recovery time, the liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. So when you're in recovery time, what's recovery time? That could be walking slowly down the hill, it could be cycling slowly, maybe it's on the rebound or it could be just doing the health bounce, that's the health bounce. When you're in recovery time, that's when the liver converts the lactic acid back to pyruvate. So when you're in recovery time, your cells are burning just as much fuel as when you're running for your life and in recovery time, all the lactic acid is being mopped up. That's why the high intensity interval training is the most powerful form of exercise there is. A lot of uh, trainers are training their athletes, their peak athletes, in this because even if they're going to do a 5K run, this is the best way to train for them, is the high intensity interval training. So when we get to the second set of high intensity, we're getting to the end of the second set, the glycogen stores are being plucked. Maybe by the third set, we've run out of glycogen stores. And so now, the brain causes a release of the human growth hormone. The human growth hormone is very active when we're growing. When we stop growing, does, it probably doesn't surprise you to know that I stopped growing when I was 16. When we stop growing, the human growth hormone goes into retirement. But when you get to the point in your high intensity interval training where you're running out of glycogen stores, the brain triggers the pituitary gland to release the human growth hormone, which activates hormone sensitive lipase. And hormone sensitive lipase is the, is the hormone that breaks up fat stores. Lipase is the enzyme in the body that breaks up fat. So hormone-sensitive lipose is released to start releasing fat stores. Remember, that's just our stored fuel. And then the human growth hormone tricks or flips the body over into another form of fuel consumption. It becomes a fat burner. Let me show you why. Glucose. Glucose burns at four calories per gram. Whereas fat, it burns at nine calories per gram. What's a calorie? It's a unit of energy. Can you see why the human growth hormone starts burning fat as fuel? Because it's going to give more than twice the units of energy compared to glucose. 
because we're moving. The human growth hormone also increases the body's ability to utilize protein. We've looked at the importance of eating sufficient protein. We've looked at the importance of not drinking with your meals so you're not watering down your digestive juices so you can access that protein. Now we're looking at another aspect, uh, and that is implementing the high intensity interval training every day causes a release of the human growth hormone which increases your body's ability to utilize protein. The human growth hormone also increases the circulation of the blood to the skin. So it slows down aging. Isn't that good news? The movie stars used to pay, or sometimes some of them still do, pay $1,000 a week for the human growth hormone. I'm offering it to your cut price today. <laughs> 15 minutes high intensity interval training a day will cause a release of the human growth hormone which can remain active for 24 hours. What a bargain. Isn't God good? Aren't the best things in life free? This costs nothing but effort. <laughs> make an appointment. If you don't make an appointment, you won't do it. But regarding the diabetic, as you start to do the high intensity which, with a a, with a release of the human growth hormone, something's happening at the cellular level, extra receptor sites are developing for insulin. Remember what insulin resistance is? Sick of the side of you. <laughs> Doing the high intensity interval training, you know what it says now? Actually, we want you more. <laughs> we need fuel. So insulin resistance can be turned around in one week. One week by drinking adequate water, by going to the diet that we just explained, which really is the Garden of Eden diet, by implementing the high intensity interval training, can cause a total turnaround of that. So Dan came to us when he was 19. He got diabetes type one when he was 15 because he had a bad chest cold and the doctor put him on high dose of very strong antibiotic which killed the beta cells in his pancreas. So when he came to us at the age of 19, he was on 90 units of insulin a day. In the first week, he didn't tell me this till later, in the first week at our retreat, the first two days of juices, it's mostly vegetable juices, and that always balances blood sugar levels nicely. He was getting blood sugar level low in the middle of the night. Why? Well, his 90 units of insulin allowed him to eat that. <laughs> we didn't serve that. And so now he's on too much insulin, and too much insulin takes the blood sugar level too low. So if he'd go too low, he'd take a candy in the middle of the night and that would always give him a headache because boom, gets the blood sugar level up very high. Second week he felt a bit guilty because he was with us for four weeks, so he'd eat an apple in the middle of the night if he got a blood sugar level low. It takes a long time to eat an apple in the middle of the night. But he didn't get the headache. Third week, instead of having, well he stopped the candies, Instead of having the apple, he'd get out of bed, jump down, and do 30 push-ups. What did that release? His glycogen. And if he needed more, some of his fat cells. He said, why didn't anyone tell me about glycogen? I call it the diabetic's best kept secret. It's glycogen stores. It's already in the muscle cell. He told me that he got up one morning and he's now, our, our levels on blood sugars are the same as Canada. So he got up in the morning and his blood glucose levels were three. So you shouldn't go under uh, five. His were three. That's nearly passing out. So we had a little bit of the salt. Remember that mineralized salt? Had some water, got dressed, had some more water, put his joggers on and went for a run. Came back, took his blood glucose levels, nine. Where'd that come from? All he'd had is water. 
and that little bit of salt, those minerals help to release it. Use glycogen stores and maybe some fat reserves there. He went home after four weeks and he was on 10 units of insulin a day. What was he on when he came to us? 90. He said to me, my doctor told me my pancreas was dead. I said, is it gangrene? What's dead? It's either dead or it's alive. <laughs> Leviticus 17.11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. If there's blood going to the pancreas, I would like to suggest it's alive. <laughs> it just needs to be revived. It just needs to be given the right conditions so it becomes a happy pancreas. Uh, at the health retreat in Alabama, so this happened probably about six or seven years ago now, we had a man attend our program. I called him Tom. He was 62. And when he came to our retreat, he was in a wheelchair. He said, I can walk, but the problem is recently they took the lymph nodes out of my groin to try and find out why I had diabetes. So when he took the plane trip, his legs swelled with lymph fluid because he'd lost his lymph nodes in his groin. He said, I've spent a million dollars on my health in the last 10 years. He was from Florida. He said, I go to the best specialists but he said, they've just told me they can do no more for me. He was on medication for blood pressure, blood cholesterol, blood thinning. He was on 90 units of insulin a day, short and long acting. He'd been diagnosed as type one diabetic. And when he came, his legs were swollen. He said, I won't be able to do the walk with everyone else. I said, no, you're right, you won't. But I said, I want you to get on the rebound of the little mini trampoline for one minute every hour and just do this. This is called the health bounce. You see, what the rebounder does, it stimulates the lymphatic system, gets it moving. Within 24 hours, the legs had gone down by, I'd say, 60, 70%. He was a very happy man. He started to do some of the walks, not too far, because remember, he's got to be careful of those legs because the lymph nodes are gone. At the end of two weeks, he'd gone from 90 units of insulin a day down to 10 units of insulin a day. That's remarkable. <laughs> blood glucose levels can be changed very quickly. He stopped his blood thinner, he stopped his blood cholesterol, he stayed on a little bit of blood pressure. Blood pressure usually can take a little bit longer. He emailed me three months later. He said to me, I've lost 80 pounds in three months. He said, I am off all my medication. This is type one diabetic, off all his insulin. I said, that's impressive, Tom. He said, I swim 30 laps of the pool a day. He said, I cycle for six miles a day and I rebound about three minutes, three times a day. And he said, I do exactly what you told me. Because when he came, he said, anything you say, I will do. So I went back to my doctor there astonished. He's the CEO of some big companies. He said he went back into the office. He said, watch out, I'm back. <laughs> when he first got back, he's 62, his wife's 42. She said, this is your baby. I'm not interested. I like my champagne and my croissants. Well, after three months, she's having another look at her husband. In fact, He's not grumpy anymore. You see, when the blood sugar levels are low, our brain can only hold a two minute supply of glucose. So when blood glucose levels go low, how long does it take before blood's not working well, brain's not working well anymore? Two minutes. And they're grumpy and irritable and bite everyone's head off. In fact, when he said, watch out, I'm back, all the staff went, oh no. But a different man came in. A totally different man, because he now had a brain that's getting co consistent, steady delivery of fuel, so his emotions, <laughs> his mood is different. In fact, he and his wife remarried. She said, I've got a new man. 
And after three months, guess who became interested? His wife did. He emailed me about five, minute, five months later after the first program and he said, she's doing it. He said, she's already lost 20 pounds and she's excited and all her girlfriends want to know what she's doing. He said, I eat two meals a day. Now, what are most diabetics told to eat? Every couple of hours. But even when the stomach's empty, do you know your duodenum is where the nutrients are taken up? And you can keep blood sugar levels balanced quite nicely between meals, even going five or six hours between meals, by having the salt and the water, that crystal of Celtic salt. In fact, it's called time-restricted eating. You have a look at time-restricted eating. It's the most popular way of eating today. And it's eating twice in a 24-hour in a period, six hours apart. Do you remember Ellen White said in the little book, uh, Counts on Diet Food and Ministry of Healing, way back in the late 1800s, two meals are better than three. Five to six hours apart. Isn't it interesting what science is showing today? Now, this time-restricted eating, that's come from the 5-2 diet, the intermittent fasting. You've probably heard of those popular diets today. What they're finding with the time-restricted eating, people are losing weight, blood glucose levels are balancing out, uh, so diabetes is being conquered, and blood pressure, the effect, all these effects, all from the time restricted eating. What they advocate is eating a main meal at one and a main meal at seven. But to me, that defies reason. We need to go back to the old saying, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> so I share those two remarkable stories with you. We've seen many type 2 diabetics conquer, but these two stories... One man was 19, one man was 62, and they both conquered their diabetes. People say to me, you've got so many success stories, Barbara. Do you have any failures? Do you know there's only, the only failure is on the part of the person to do what you've got to do to get the results. We can open the floor for questions now. Are there any questions? Hello, um, my question comes from a member of Safe to Serve International. Her name is Michelle Henry. She wants to know, what do you think of pink Himalayan salt? Pink Himalayan salt has 75 minerals. It's not as, it's not as good as the Celtic salt, which has 82 minerals. And one of the beauties of the Celtic salt is the crystals that are formed that contains some micronutrients that are not found in the Himalayan salt. And one of them, a very valuable one, and I mentioned it last night, was the iodine. So Himalayan salt is certainly better than the table salt, but it is not as good as the Celtic salt. Hi, how are you tonight? Um, the question I have is, what would you suggest on treating candida and yeast? The good news is I've written a whole book on that because I find that uh, there's a lot of ignorance about the danger of mould. It's called self-heal by design. Now, um, the book is sold out at the moment, but my daughter told me on the phone before I came here that tomorrow she's getting a shipment of 10,000. Her website is www, very easy to remember, mistymountainusa.com. So if you contact her tomorrow or the next day through that website, um, she's got a whole team of people because she's got a backlog of <coughs> uh, orders for 5,000 books. But we've already ordered another 10,000, so the book should be available. It's a, it's a little book. It's a simple book. It's very easy to read. You could read it easy 
in a few hours, but it has programs in there on how to conquer uh, yeast in the body. What's that website again? www.mistymountainusa. So the full word mountain. Yes, excuse me. Um, my mother has uh, high blood pressure and diabetes, and you mentioned Misty Mountain. She lives in Tennessee. So I was wondering, are all um, reserves like Misty Mountain the same or equal? Should I look for the closest one, or do you have a recommendation? Uh, from the health retreat I was at last week that do run two programs a month, and are very similar to what we do is Eden Valley Retreat in Denver, Colorado. Okay. So that is probably the, the closest retreat in the US to what we do. Okay, I know there's one other one called Wildwood. I'm not sure yes. if that one yes. good or not. Yeah, there is Wildwood. I, I'm not sure if they do a similar program to us, but I know um, Eden Valley does. Okay, I'll check that out. Thanks. Real quick, one other question. Um, a friend of mine has a daughter who gets Caesars. I don't know if that, that's applicable to this program, but well, she there's an ex to ask. There's an excellent book. It's called Stop Autism Now by Dr. Bruce Fife, F-I-F-E. And he shows how uh, coconut oil can help to conquer seizures. He talks about the ketogenic diet. You can do a plant-based ketogenic diet, which is low carbohydrate, high fiber, generous proteins, and he suggests supplementing with coconut oil because in the liver, the coconut oil breaks down to neuro healers called ketones. I know you had mentioned the, um, the cereal and Cereal. And yogurt is high in sugar, but what about plain yogurt or oats? Um, one of the problems with oats is it's high in, an in, in a plant chemical called lectins, and lectins uh, can increase inflammation in the body. Now, my three sons eat oatmeal every morning and love their oatmeal, but they don't have any health problems. But if if someone has a health problems, I advise that they keep away from oatmeal until their health problem has been conquered. You can buy yogurts that don't have sugar in them, they'd be great. You can buy cashew yogurts, almond yogurts, organic soy yogurts, that is true. Um, Sister Barbara, thank you so much for your talk. I have um, two questions, if you don't mind. The first is, you hinted on it a little bit, but are there some best practices for individuals that are um, at the beginning stages of regulating their blood sugar? They have the highs and the lows, some things that they can do when the blood sugar goes high or when you it goes see, low. You always look at why. And if the blood sugar levels are going up and down, you look at your last meal. Because there was something in that last meal um, that caused that high and low. So that's why it's important to have a look at the glycemic index and go for low glycemic index foods. But we've had incredible success with the, the simple proceed or the simple guidelines that I've given you today. We see, in fact, at Eden Valley last week, there was a lady on, on uh, two different uh, insulins and also another medication for diabetes and on, I think it was Saturday morning, she came to me and she said, look at my blood sugar levels. She said, they're normal and I haven't taken any insulin today. Now this lady's in her 60s and she's been, she's been trying to conquer this for a long time and it was just the diet that I've been telling you about here. So very quickly you can get blood sugar levels balanced out. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, um, I know there's individuals that have diabetes that has been um, started because of drugs, a drug-induced uh, diabetes. Um, do you have any uh, tips for those individuals who are trying to um, regulate that? Is that something that can be regulated with diet? You know, I find that no matter what the cause is, and I agree with you, I've had several children come to us who 
develop diabetes after their childhood vaccinations. And Dan, the young man I told you about, it was a heavy course of antibiotics that killed his beta cells. No matter what the cause, every diabetic responds to this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Sister Barbara. I'm um, interested in your thoughts on eating for blood type. Yes, I've got a, a very quick, great answer for that. Horses have seven different blood types and they all eat grass. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I, I just think some of the healthiest people on the planet live in mountains and they don't even know what, they've never had a blood test, you know. So that's why I say you're the doctor. If it works, do it. If it's not working, keep adjusting until you, you find out what works for you. Good evening. Can you please explain the correlation between cholesterol and vitamin D? And also, a lot of vegans, vegetarians, and plant-based dieters have very low cholesterol levels. What should we do about it? We're arranging 45, 50 in both LDL and HDA. HDL, what can we do about this? I believe that when you start giving the body the right conditions, that will automatically balance out. And the sustain me model basically are the right conditions. I do find that a lot of people don't eat enough protein, especially, especially plant-based. They don't eat enough protein and they don't eat enough fat. And many overdo the carbohydrates, thus my illustration today. And that should balance it out. And the vitamin D, there are 2,500 receptor sites on the DNA for vitamin D. So, um, low vitamin Ds affect every single body function, including the production of cholesterol. That is true. Thank you, Sister Barbara. Um, two questions. What do you think about women going for the usual or annual pap smear? It used to be annually. Now they said every six months. Do you think that is recommended, or should we? No. I never have them. But you know what I do? I give my body the right conditions. And every time a woman has a pap smear, her cervix is now sustained more damage. Every six months, more damage, more damage. So um, I'm sorry, but I can't agree with them. Okay, thanks. Second question is, um, what would you recommend for one who is going through menopause, where this, when, you, when the heat hits your body, it feels like fire under your skin? What do it, you do? It is, a, it is the result of a hormonal imbalance. And if you Google my name and hormones, you'll find a 50-minute lecture on hormones and it shows why hormones are out of balance and it also shows how you can get the balance back. Um, someone listening online is asking the question, is it okay to eat broccoli, carrots, cabbage raw or are they supposed to be cooked? If someone has a underactive thyroid gland the brassicas, which is cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli, are high in goitrogens. And goitrogens inhibit thyroid function. But if you cook it, that disarms the goitrogens. So if someone has an overactive thyroid gland, the raw brassicas are good because it will slow it down. But if someone has an underactive thyroid gland, they're best to cook all those brassicas. Hello, good evening. I have a family friend who, is, um, who has diabetes right now and he's taking metformin. I was wondering if that was something um, very hard to um, come off of. Now we find people in the health retreat within 48 hours they're coming off their metformin. 
I leave it with the person, they're taking their blood glucose levels, usually every day, maybe a couple of times a day, and with the change in diet, the blood glucose levels drop down and then they can start uh, reducing the medication. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, good evening, Sister Barbara. Like I said, we drove nine hours to come here and stay with some friends mm -hmm. for this. But nonetheless, um, my sister has been told that she has too much vitamin D in her body. So what do you think of that? Uh, is she taking supplements? You'd have to investigate um, as to why. If she's taking supplements, she stops the supplements. I um, have, to, have to know a little bit more about that to comment. Sister Barbara, for someone who has gone through a heart attack, um, would you recommend them to do high intensity um, exercise? Yeah. That would be okay? There is no record of a heart attack doing the high intensity. It's actually the safest form of exercise. Sounds good. Thank you. Hello. I've been into natural healing for many, many years, and I've read almost every book except yours. And um, when it comes to um, diabetes, 99% of everything they ever say is about type 2. They say, do this for type 2. They don't mention type 1, except they say, there's nothing you can do for type 1. And they just ignore it. The rest of the book is about type 2. So type 1 is obviously more challenging, and everybody who's on type 2 that's listens to the media, says, I'm screwed, I gotta take massive amounts of whatever, and that's all I've got. Can you comment, will this work for type one? Absolutely, the two stories I just related to you were both type one. I don't talk about type two, because that's easy fixed. Well, right. <laughs> but the type two, what is claimed is that the beta cells in the pancreas are dead or not working, but I maintain if there's blood, the life of the flesh going through the pancreas, it can be revived. And we live in an amazing body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. And when you give it the right conditions, it does revive. You are right, type two responds a lot quicker, but I relate the type one stories purely because they're the hardest, and yet we've seen people totally recover. Right, because the people that I know have type one says, well, I'm sorry, my pancreas is dead, there's nothing I can do. They've been misinformed, yes? That's right, that's right. There okay. Is, there's a lot of deception around. Thank you. Okay, let's say a closing prayer and, and we're having a song, I think. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this body. We will never stop praising you and thank you. As Psalm 34 says, while I live, will I yet praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Please bless everyone who hears this lecture and give them the courage and the determination to, to implement what they've heard tonight and see the results. Thank you, Father, for we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen for that powerful information. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and dreary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary. Calvary, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, as God is calling us to a higher standard, do we understand that? Amen. God is calling us to a higher standard, brethren. And it is my prayer, and I pray that along with you, that we choose to come up higher by the grace of God. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are on bended knee, and we realize that our time here is short. Help us to understand, dear Father, your truth. We pray that you may touch our hearts and our minds, and that you may prepare us to meet our God in peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, what good is it to be a healthy sinner, brethren? If we have all this information to learn how to heal the body, which God has made already to heal itself, and yet we don't understand that we are spiritually sick. 
We don't understand our spiritual condition because it's very, very easy to understand that, hey, my, my body is reacting. I need to go see a doctor, we, we tell ourselves, because I'm not feeling very well. But how about our spiritual condition? When we are not willing to heed to the callings of the Holy Spirit, we're looking at seven miracles of Jesus Christ. And we are learning, God is teaching us how we can be healed spiritually. Today we're going to look at the miracle that God did on the sea. As he calmed the sea. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you will, with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. Do we have our Bibles with us? Do we have our Bibles? Amen? All right. Amen. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. Notice what the Word of God says. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over onto the other side. What did Jesus say? Let us pass over onto the other side. You know, a lot of times Jesus is speaking and we're not paying attention. Because Jesus just told them that we're going to the other side. Jesus is going to take his people to the other side. And that other side is the promised land, brethren. Jesus is going to take his people to the promised land. The question is, do you remember the words of Jesus? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Am I keeping the word of God as the psalmist said, thy word have I done what? Thy word have I hid where? In my heart. And what is the result? I will not sin. I will not sin, brethren. This is the result of the word of God. Jesus says, we are going to the other side. Amen. Verse 36. And when they sent, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was. Where was he? He was in the ship. Who was Jesus in that ship? Jesus was the captain of that ship. That's who Jesus was. He told the disciples, he says, we're going to the other side. Who was leading that ship? It was Jesus. Jesus was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm. What arose? A great storm of wind and of waves that beat into the ship so that it was now full. What was in the, what was in the ship? I almost gave you the answer. It was water. The ship was full of water. They were about to sink. But wait a minute. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, we, we read there that these are fishermen. They're acquainted with storms, aren't they? That means that this storm must have been a, a special kind of storm where they were afraid for their lives. And it says here in verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship. Who is he? That's Jesus. Asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Master, carest thou not that we perish? Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care, brother? What was the problem with the disciples here? They were focused on something. And it wasn't really on Jesus. In fact, notice what we're told by the pen of inspiration here. Where were they absorbed? They were absorbed in their own efforts to do what? They were trying to save themselves by their own efforts. A lot of times we do that. A lot of times we're trying to save ourselves by our own efforts. How is that possible? Well, it's good to use natural remedies but are you giving God the glory? Brethren, are we trying to save ourselves? They had forgotten that Jesus was on board. What did they forget? The most important thing, that Jesus was the captain of that ship. 
That was the most important thing, and they forgot why. Because they were so busy looking at their storm. They were so busy absorbed in them trying to save themselves from the coming storm. A, a, a what? A crisis is coming, brethren. Now seeing their labor in vain. This is in the red. This is a good condition now. Because notice, now they see that their labors are what? Do we understand this, brethren? Our labors are in vain. Everything that we do is in vain if Jesus is not in the midst of it. How many of us are going to go into the country and be lost? May God have mercy on our souls. Now seeing their labor vain and only death before them, now they remembered they were desperate. Now they understood, I need Jesus. And guess what, brethren? That's a good condition to be in. Because when you are, in, when you are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, what happens? You don't see your need. And this is the spiritual condition of the majority of the world. Not just those in Laodicea, brethren. This is the condition of the world. So now Jesus brought them into the storm. He was the captain. He was leading the ship. Let's go to the other side. The storm came. Did you know that Jesus wants us to go through the storm? And a lot of us don't want that. In fact, we don't want the trial. Nobody wants that. Uh-uh. And then they remember the words of Jesus, that he had set them out and commanded them to go across on the sea. In Jesus was their only hope. That's where we need to be today. We need to understand that our only hope is in Christ. In their helpless despair, they cried out. Who were they crying out to? Jesus. What were they saying? Master. Oh, yes. Master. But the dense darkness hid him from their sight. They couldn't see Jesus even still. They couldn't see Jesus again because it was too dark. Spiritually, in this world, we are filled and surrounded with darkness. The Bible tells us it is gross darkness. Can we see Jesus? Oh, if we had one glimpse of glory, just one glimpse, then we would recognize our wretchedness. Then we would recognize our desperation. Then we would be where Jesus would want us to be. But we need to have that moment. We need to understand that Jesus is leading us to the storm. Oh, that's not an easy saying. As what happened in John chapter 6. This is a hard saying. Who can bear it? Jesus is leading me where? No, he's not. Jesus doesn't want me to go to the storm, does he? Their voices were drowned by what? The roaring of the tempest. And there was no reply. So what happened? What took hold of them? The opposite of faith, brethren. Doubt and fear assailed them. Was he who had conquered disease and demons and even death powerless to help his disciples now? Was he powerless? Oh, no, brethren. We know better than that. We know better than that. Look at what it says in Isaiah 57. Turn with me there. Isaiah 57, notice what the Word of God says about the wicked. I pray this is not our condition, but we must understand something. Isaiah 57, verse 20, it says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea. What are the wicked compared to? The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. What happens to the wicked, brethren? They have no peace, the Bible tells us, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. What is mire? Mire is wet clay, very wet clay. Remember the miry clay in the image? It's useless. It cannot be formed. And so... 
the wicked are unable to allow Christ to lead them in the storm. Where are they found when the ship is a sail? They're found in the waters. Again, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is what for the wicked? There is no peace for the wicked, saith God. There's no peace, brethren. Why? Because they have no hope. They are living a Christless life. And what will happen to the wicked? They will die a Christless death. Is there any hope for them? Brethren, let's take a look at this. When God told us here with the disciples, the experience of the disciples, when they were with Jesus, what kind of condition did they have? They were, they were without faith. They were like the wicked brethren. They were hopeless because they lost sight of Jesus. And so we have to understand that any time we lose sight of Christ, what happens? We are like the wicked, brethren. Well, we don't want to hear that. Say, what? I'm, I'm like the... No, I'm not like the wicked. I always have strong faith. Brethren, we need to stop patting ourselves in the back. And we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. And say, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Are we going to make it to the other side, brethren? That's the question. Are we going to make it? Oh, brethren, are we ready for what is coming? Are we ready? You know, when I consider the fate of the wicked, oh, mercy. Let's go to Psalm 107. Let's turn there. What will happen to the wicked, brethren? They will perish. Psalm 107, look at verse 23. It says, They that go down to the sea in the ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works, verse, verse 24, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wit's end. Huh. Notice what it says here, brethren. We're told here that the, the wicked are going to be tossed to and fro, right? Right? And so now the Lord is telling us he's going to send us to the sea where the waves are going to be tossing us to and fro. So even if you consider yourself to be righteous or wicked, no matter what condition you think you are spiritually, you're going to go through the storm. And the trying of our faith will let us know whether we are wicked or righteous. Because character is revealed when? When the storm comes. When the storm comes, the character is revealed. Will we be like the wicked or the righteous when the storm comes? Take a look at this. In Testimonies, Volume 8, page 315, it says, A storm is coming. How is it described? Relentless. What does that mean? That means there's no stopping it, brethren. A storm is coming relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? This is a very important question. This is a very important question. If I were you, I'd pay attention. Are you paying attention? We need not say the perils of the last days are soon to come upon us. That's, that's not what we need to say. Why not? In the red, already they have come. How is that possible? I thought we were still under the time where it's a respite before the time of trouble. 
How can it be said by the pen of inspiration that we are now in a time of trouble? How is that possible, brethren? I hope you're paying attention. We need now the sword of the Lord. What is that sword? Oh, that's the word, brethren. What did Jesus tell us? He says, we're going to the other side. Have you heard Jesus tell you that? Huh. Are you following Jesus? We need now the sword of the Lord to cut to the very soul and marrow of what, brethren? Are you reading with me? I can't hear you. We need that word to cut through the fleshly lust. That's what we need. What else? The appetites and the passions. We need the word of God to show us our spiritual condition. You know, we can easily tell and diagnose ourselves when we're sick. We're like, oh, man, something's going on inside of me. I don't feel good. But can, can, can we discern our spiritual condition? What does the Lord tell us through the psalmist? Look what, look what it says here in Psalm. We should know this psalm. Psalm 137. Psalm 139. Excuse me. Psalm 1. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. What did the psalmist say? He said, Lord, I need your help. I don't understand my own condition spiritually. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. And see if there be what? Lord, am I the wicked? Am I like the wicked? Am I being tossed to and fro? Am I ready for the coming crisis? Do I realize my spiritual depravity? Do I understand my wretchedness, brethren? Oh, mercy. What does God tell us? We need the word of God to cut through our fleshly lusts. We need to stop playing church, brethren. That's what we need to do. We come to church and we make a show of it. And that's what the Bible tells us. God is telling us. He sees us like the wicked until we are converted. And that's what we need. We need God to change the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we operate. To cut through what again? The fleshly lust, the appetites and passions. Let's, let's make sense of this right now, by God's grace. What is God telling us? He's telling us that if you don't understand your spiritual condition, then when the time of trouble hits, you will not be ready because right now you're in a time of trouble already because you don't understand your spiritual condition. Do you hear God speaking to you? You're in a time of trouble because you don't understand your spiritual condition. That's what God is telling us. Let's keep reading. Minds that have been given up to loose thought need to change. Are you checking your thoughts? Or are you allowing your thoughts to run loose? Oh, brethren. Oh, you mean my thoughts? God is concerned with what I think? The very intents of my soul? God wants to know what's, what the inner man is thinking? Are you ready for the time that is coming? The thoughts must be centered where? The thoughts must be centered upon God. Now is the time. When? When the crisis comes, right? No, brethren. Now is the time to put forth earnest effort to do what? To overcome the natural tendencies of the carnal heart. We are in a time of trouble. Because we don't understand our carnal nature. We don't understand where we stand with God. We don't understand when we stand in the hour of judgment. Oh, brethren, do we understand? Our efforts, our self-denial, our perseverance must be proportionate to the infinite value of the object of which we are in pursuit. What are we after? We're going to the other side. I'm following my captain, Jesus Christ. How about you? I'm going to the other side. I'm following Jesus Christ. And what does he tell me? He tells me that I need to. Let's read that again. My efforts, 
my self-denial. Let's, let's put ourselves there, brethren. My perseverance must be proportionate to what? To the infinite value. How, how, what, how valuable is this? It's infinitely valuable. The object that we are after cost Jesus his life. Do we understand what we are after? It is of infinite value. Oh, brethren, are we getting ready for Jesus? Notice what it says. Let's keep going in Psalm 107. Come back here. It says in verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distress. What do we need to do? The answer is right here. We need to cry out to God, Lord, help me. I need your help. Lord, save me. I need you to save me, Lord. We need to understand our condition. It says, he maketh the storm a calm, so that the ways thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Where are we headed? What did Jesus say? We're going to the other side. That's where we're going. We're going to the promised land. We're going to, to be with Jesus Christ himself, but we need to stay on the ship. You ever heard that before? All right, we'll get to that. But we need to stay on the ship with Jesus. Amen. That's right. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I'm going. Let's go back to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. It says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea. And what did he say? Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have how much faith? Who has no faith? Is, it, is that the righteous? That is the wicked. Why are you being tossed to and fro with the waves? Why is it that when trouble comes, you're so easily distressed? Why don't you have faith? Why don't you trust in God? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What kind of a man is this? Hold on a minute. Let's go back. It says here that they were afraid when the storm came. <laughs> they were afraid they were going to die. They were afraid that they were going to lose their body. But then when Jesus calmed the storm, they, it says they were exceedingly afraid. Now they were afraid that they were going to lose their body and soul in the presence of God. What did Jesus say? Fear not them that destroy the body, but fear him that destroys both soul and body in hell. Now they knew they were in the presence of God. They realized that they lacked faith in God and they thought that they would perish. They were about to die. But brethren, what does God tell us in Isaiah 26, verse 3? Let's read that. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. <clears throat> Praise God for his word. That will keep him, how? In perfect peace. How do we have perfect peace? We need to have our minds. Hold on a minute. Do you understand what God is telling us right now? He's telling us that the war over the mind is where that trouble begins. That's where the trouble is at right now. We can't control our mind. But we don't understand that. And we try to help ourselves. 
we take on self-help classes so that we can improve our mental state. But what we don't understand is that we can't help ourselves, that we need the help of who? We need the help of Jesus. We need the great physician to heal the sick sin soul. That's me. I need Jesus to touch me. And I need, as we saw yesterday, we need to have that touch of faith, right? As we've been seeing. We need to have that faith that moves the hand of God. <laughs> what kind of faith is this? That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Because what? What was Jesus doing? Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> Jesus was in perfect peace. Why? Because his mind was stayed upon the Father. Jesus was in perfect. Let's read that. Desire of Ages 336. It says, when Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. That's the mind of Jesus right there. Let this mind be in you. That is also in Christ Jesus. He was, he was trusting in his Father's power. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. Praise God. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of the earth and sea and sky that he responded or reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. And he says, I can of my own self do how much? I'm not trusting in my own ability. I'm here to give you an example. I'm here to show you how to prepare for the storm. It begins in the mind, brethren. And that's why when we see the signs of the coming of Christ and we know that the storm is imminent because the second coming is also imminent, then we become troubled because we're looking at the problem and not the solution. We're looking at the storm and it is relentless in its fury. It is a time of trouble such as never was. And yet, if we're not keeping our minds on Jesus and brethren, let me let me say it more practically. If we're not asking God for help. If we're not on our knees pleading with God, Lord, help me. I need your help. My mind keeps wondering. I keep thinking perverse things. My mind is not right. I'm not ready for the crises. Oh, brethren, this is not a joke. This is reality. Where is your mind at? Are we ready for what is coming? Jesus said he trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of the word, which still the storm, was the power of God. God has the power to calm the storm. That storm, that trouble, that time of trouble that is already taking place in our mind, Jesus can calm that storm. And that's what he wants to do. So what are we to do? We need to stay on the ship with Jesus. Now, let me get to that. I'm closing here. I'm closing here, brethren. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus says to his disciples, as he calls his disciples, that they were fishers of men. Now, Jesus says, I will make you fishers of what? I will make you fishers of men. They were fishermen already, but God says, I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to give you a new occupation. You used to make money going out into the sea and throwing out your net so that you can bring and reel in some fishes. And Jesus uses that as a parable. And he tells us in Matthew 13, 
verse 47. What does he say there? He likens heaven and the gospel to a net. Are you familiar with that? Again, the kingdom of God is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Let's make sense of this. In order for you to cast out your net, you have to be at sea. And more than likely, you are either out on the boat or on a pier. But in the time of the disciples, where were they to cast out their net? They were on a boat or on a ship. They were on a ship. So now, let's come back a, a few steps and then we'll walk together. In order for us to be able to help somebody, first we need Jesus to help us. Because if we haven't allowed Jesus to help us, we are in no condition to help anyone else. In fact, if you try to help somebody when you are being oppressed and possessed of Satan, you are going to breathe on them the same spirit that you have. So in order for you to help somebody else, you need to have Jesus to cast out that devil from you first. You need to allow Jesus to help you. And we just had that Bible study by understanding your condition, your mental condition, that you have trouble in your mind and that you don't realize it. Once you realize that and you allow Jesus to help you, now you can become a fisher of men. Now you can help somebody. But you must stay on the boat with Jesus. And Jesus, while he's on the boat, he's going to lead you to storms of life. He's going to lead you to hard times, for trials, for the trying of your faith. Worketh patience, brethren, so that you can have the patience of the saints. God is preparing us so that we can be evangelists. So when Jesus says, stay on the ship, then you have to be in a ship where the truth is being heard. Because who is Jesus? Jesus is the truth. So you cannot be in the ship with Jesus unless you are being led by him who is the truth. Let's make sense of this. So when someone tells you to stay in the ship and listen to lies from the pulpit, this is not from Christ. Because then you're not getting on the ship with Jesus. Jesus would never tell you a lie. Because he's not a liar. So in order for you to understand this, brethren, first you have to allow God to give you that perfect peace. Once you receive that perfect peace and you allow your mind to stay on Christ, you allow his word to remain in you, then you can stay on the ship. Then you are on the correct ship because you might be on the wrong ship. You might be on the wrong ship unless it's Christ who's the captain. And Christ is telling us we're going to the other side. We're going to the promised land. Are you preparing yourself to go to the other side? How many of you want to make it to the other side? Anybody here? Anybody? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these words that have inspired us to examine ourselves, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and minds. Lord, we are asking you, help us to understand that we are in a time of trouble and that we need the Holy Spirit to help us to understand our spiritual condition. 
How can we prepare for the time that is ahead if we do not allow you to work in us now? Oh, dear Lord, help us to stand in this hour of judgment is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, please, Father, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. At this time, <clears throat> I'm going to ask my wife and my boys to come up, and they're going to sing for us a song as we close. Let us meditate on the words as well as what we have heard. Good evening, everyone. It's been a wonderful evening. It's been such a blessing, and I pray that as we sing this song, it may even bring us closer to Christ.
Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, the Lord is good. And, and praise God for my family that came up with that song. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out, those of you here locally, those of you online. I know it's been a blessing for me, so I'm sure it's been a blessing for you. I hope to see you again tomorrow as we continue the seven days of miracles in these last days. May God help us and Maranatha.